Hi, thank you so much for joining our Zoom meeting today. We will discuss the Pluto paradigm, uh, breaking it down into the specific steps that EA astrologers use for an EA interpretation. The best way to do that is to use example charts, real life case studies, because one of the most important principles to understand about evolutionary astrology is that no one size fits all. Millions of people were born with the same natal chart, and yet it can be, yet it can be expressed in a diversity of raised, ways relative to individual context. This is why it is so important to use the evolutionary states to incorporate all the individual background or context to arrive at a correct chart analysis. Again, evolutionary astrology is based on observation and correlation. No one size fits all. And I would like to invite the whole group to participate, to interact, to ask questions as they arise, because the best way to facilitate uh, group discussions is to have all the questions uh, spoken as they occur so that we all stay on the same page. Uh, with that, the best place to get started in terms of applying the Pluto paradigm is to start with the first step of the EA, of EA chart interpretation. From an EA point of view, we're always going to look at Pluto as the starting point of our chart interpretation. Why is this? Why, do, why does evolutionary astrology focus on Pluto as being the bottom line or foundation point for chart analysis? This is because from an evolutionary perspective, Pluto correlates to the soul. Well, what is the soul? Uh, the soul is an immutable consciousness of energy that cannot be destroyed, it can only change form. That really speaks to the evolution of the soul from progressive lifetime to lifetime. The soul inherently stays intact. So the evolutionary journey in a nutshell, or condensed down, is to purge away or to be rid of the false barriers or false conditionings that we've taken in that do not reflect our soul nature. It's essentially ridding ourselves of the things we are not. In the East, we call this nete, nete. Not this, not that. Not this, not that. What drives or what facilitates this evolution? Desire. Desire is the bottom line when you look at Pluto. Pluto correlates to our underlying desires of the past that we pick up with coming into the life. Within the soul, there are two co-equal yet antithetical desires, one to return to source, one to separate away. It is exactly the interfacement between these two desires that determines the nature of our current reality, the why. When we understand the why, when we understand how these two desires interact in any given moment in our lives, we can then potentially make choices, Pluto choices, that will facilitate deeper growth and a healing from wounds that we've occurred in, in this and other lifetimes. So again, it's the interaction between the two co-equal antithetical desires within the soul, one to return, one to separate, that determines that which we think we need at any given moment in time and the choices we then make. This is why we start with Pluto. When you look at Pluto and you understand it from that point of view, it's what the soul has carried in, the two, uh, the, the core desires of the past that is correlated to its unconscious sense of emotional security and what the soul will then be driven uh, to recreate in a sense, the bottom line, what the soul, uh, the intrinsic orientation of that soul and the why, we can then see the habitual patterns that the soul may be recreating for itself and desiring to penetrate to understand the why. Why is it that I feel so driven or why is it that uh, this is, why is it that I keep recreating this uh, and so on? We all have those questions. 
And when we look at Pluto, we can understand the bottom, point, the bottom line of what, are, what is constituting the deepest level of security and the reasons for it. It's essentially where we left off in the past and where we'll pick up in this lifetime. It's also a deepest point of strength. Let's say, for example, when you're looking at the natal Pluto, it's also important to re-empower that soul or to look at the natal position of that soul, natal position of Pluto as also a point of strength, that it's an inherent orientation for a reason. It's the core, uh, the underlying core desires of the past, and as such, a natural strength that the soul will carry in. So that's the first step to uh, looking at a uh, birth chart, is looking at Pluto in the context of uh, its correlation to the soul, to the past life desires that uh, have occurred, the reasons for, and essentially where the soul will pick up. And within that, the bottom line of the deepest level of security is going to be symbolized by that natal Pluto. And as such, you can see the habitual patterns, the potential for recreation. At worst, uh, it can become compulsions to recreate a limited dynamic because of a desire to remain secure. Uh, um, and within that, you can then step to the next part of the Pluto paradigm, which would be Pluto's polarity point. Pluto's polarity point is going to symbolize the current evolutionary intentions for the life. And essentially, it's how to balance that natal Pluto by embracing the opposite house and sign, the opposite psychology. In that way, habitual patterns of the past uh, can be uh, overcome. They can be regenerated. Regeneration is a very Scorpio-Pluto eighth house word. Essentially, um, you never, uh, I don't want to portray this as leaving your natal Pluto to embrace the polarity. You embrace the polarity in order to revisit that natal Pluto, in order to evolve that natal Pluto, to bring it out in its highest expression. So what we're looking at is a circuit of energy. And we'll get more into that as we move into the south node and its planetary ruler. But please remember when you're uh, applying the Pluto paradigm that it's not moving away from one thing and going to the other. It's essentially striking a balance between those archetypes, between uh, Pluto's natal position and balancing through its polarity point in order to revisit or in order to rebirth that natal Pluto. At this point, I'll pause and invite any questions. Are we on the same page in terms of Pluto and its polarity point? Okay, so the next step then uh, is we would move to the south node. We, uh, and when I say the south node, we're moving to the south node of the moon. Well, what does the south node correlate from a, an evolutionary point of view? The south node symbolizes the prior life egocentric structure that the soul has created in order to consciously actualize or integrate the core desires of the past symbolized by the natal Pluto. Essentially, the soul creates an egocentric structure in order to integrate uh, the evolutionary lessons of the past. That's going to symbolize the south node, uh, the egocentric structure or self-image that the soul has created for itself necessarily so in order to consciously integrate the core evolutionary intentions of the past symbolized by Pluto's polarity, symbolized by the natal position of Pluto. It's also going to constitute uh, conscious emotional security. Whereas Pluto is typically unconscious in the vast majority of folks uh, until uh, we have maybe have somebody articulate it, uh, become more conscious over the life. Uh, the moon is something that uh, we can feel very consciously. And as such, when you look at the south node, you are going to immediately resonate with the emotional security that it brings because uh, it's the emotional security at a subjective or conscious level. And it's, again, it's going to be 
how that soul is consciously integrating the lesson of Pluto, of the natal position of Pluto. To make this a bit concrete, let's start with a very simple example. Let's put Pluto in the seventh house. The core desires of the past, simply stated, would be one in which the soul is desiring to initiate a diversity of relationships with, with others in order to learn through comparison and contrast who one is and who one is not and who one cannot be. Uh, typically, these souls have a great desire to give to others, but also need to learn that very, uh, the crucial lesson of the seventh house, which is balance when to give, when not to give, uh, and so on. Uh, so essentially, uh, looking at Pluto in the seventh house, uh, it's learning balance versus extremes. Uh, it's learning to withhold giving when necessary, whom to initiate relationships with and whom not. Uh, let's put the south node then in the ninth house. How are the seventh house lessons going to be consciously integrated through that south node? It's going to be one where the soul has been looking inherently for uh, or inherently has initiated relationships with others in order to have its sense of truth defined through others within the relationship. There can be an unconscious dynamic of attracting a type of teacher, teacher type person in order for the soul to under, in order for the soul to know uh, what its truth is. Uh, so essentially, there's a dependency upon others in order for uh, the soul to, uh, in order for the soul to understand what is true, what is not true, what are my beliefs, what aren't my beliefs. This is all coming through relationships that are initiated with others. Um, within that would be the issue of interpretation, that the soul might also uh, be interpreting. Uh, that others have more of a sense uh, of personal truth in themselves, that others are more teachers uh, types than themselves. Um, so there's this dynamic of dependency and attracting others in order again to, to, to know uh, what's true, what's not true, what's, uh, what is, uh, what do I believe, what do I not believe, uh, and so on. Um, the soul could also come in with a, a desire to uh, to, to align with its personal truth? Uh, could it have an inherent understanding of relativity, uh, seeing the Pluto being in the seventh house? Um, so the conscious integration point uh, would be that ninth house, uh, would be the desire to uh, align with natural law, perhaps through comparison and, and contrast, has seen the difference between belief and knowledge, or the, the, the difference between uh, conditioned belief and doctrine belief and what is uh, true uh, or natural law. Um, again, we have to put these in the evolutionary conditions, but is that main dynamic seen there? How all of this, how starting with Pluto in the seventh, uh, the core desire nature would be that initiation uh, of relationships with others in order to, through comparison and contrast, understand its own identity that would be coming through the first house uh, polarity point. Um, and then through the ninth house, it could come through a de facto teacher uh, or uh, de facto uh, teacher uh, uh, student dynamic that uh, perhaps even with the seventh house that the soul could have been cycling back and forth between a student teacher type relationships. Uh, is, is that making sense so far? Uh, any questions about that? Uh, so then the next step we'll be looking at would be the planetary ruler uh, of the south node. And it's going to inher inherently act the same way as the south node did for Pluto. It's going to be how that soul has consciously actualized the south node. So we would look to the planet Venus in this case, or we would look to the planet Jupiter. Uh, let's put Jupiter uh, in the fourth house. You could see that the soul has also been dependent upon family members, uh, the family dynamic, uh, in, in order to in order to know uh, 
truth, uh, what is truth, what is not, perhaps has internalized the underlying philosophical or belief system of the family environment. Uh, the seventh house uh, would want to accommodate that uh, um, or would perhaps uh, have had a sense of wanting to create uh, peace with others in its environment by uh, adopting the truths of others. Um, uh, th those could be the limitations of those symbols. Um, the soul would also desire to uh, progressively establish internal security with its own truth specific to relationships. That would be how that dynamic is uh, re, uh, readjusted or how that dynamic is rebirthed. Uh, is the soul progressively becoming internally secure, which would be the, the Jupiter in the fourth house, relative to its own belief system? Uh, its own uh, philosophical, metaphysical, cosmological structure, uh, its own intuitive impressions, uh, its own uh, personal truth versus the truth of others. Um, so this could be a soul who had an inherent ability to uh, counsel others uh, in situations where uh, they've been struggling to uh, break into their own truth, independent from close families or uh, relate or relationships that would be the polarity point looking at the polarity point of that first house the soul would counteract that or the soul would uh, balance out that seventh house by striking out on its own developing its own voice uh, initiating uh, autonomy and independence uh, re uh, balancing out any codependent uh, relationships this is my truth this is my path, uh, and so on. Um, so when we're looking at Pluto, the south node, and its planetary ruler, we're really looking at the core of that soul's emotional body. Again, I don't want to portray this as uh, negatives. It's not something that we're trying to move away from. It's strengths that the soul has come in with, archetypes that have been developed where the soul will naturally gravitate to coming into the life. And so you can call it the trinity of the past. Pluto, the south node, and its planetary ruler can correlate to the trinity of the past, the core of that soul's emotional body, and the core dynamics that the soul will naturally gravitate to coming into the life. Uh, does that make sense? Are we on the same page? Uh, any questions so far? Okay, I do have a, a question. Um, how do you, I mean, are you looking at, when you're looking at the, uh, the Pluto placement, are you also looking at the eighth house in Scorpio? And the Scorpio house or, or in, in planets in Scorpio? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, no, when you look at the natal Pluto, it essentially a good way to understand that, and I really appreciate your question. It is the eighth house Pluto Scorpio archetype, so it will emph it will magnetize, or it will emphasize uh, any uh, sign or house that it's in. So let's say, for example, Pluto's in the fifth, or Pluto's in the sixth house. The fifth house or the sixth house archetype is going to come under the magnification or the intensification of the Pluto archetype. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. You're welcome. So then uh, moving into uh, the next steps of the Pluto paradigm, uh, Pluto's polarity point, the North Node and its planetary ruler, and we'll break those down step by step. Uh, that's going to correlate to the trinity of the future. And again, this isn't that the soul is running away from, or if you were looking at the birth chart, please do not think to yourself that, oh, I need to not do my Pluto and I only need to do the polarity point or south node or planetary ruler or so on. Again, the key word here is balance. It's how the soul will be naturally shifting relative to the current life. And uh, from my perspective, uh, 
one of the most helpful things that we can do for ourselves, for our friends, or as counselors, is to really look at the core dynamics that the soul is returning to in order to recreate a sense of security that's no longer uh, supportive. Uh, for uh, I think most of us would agree that uh, the need to be secure uh, is met through uh, consistency of the past. Um, and that uh, to threaten that or to move towards something that's unknown uh, is to embrace the wisdom of insecurity itself because often we don't feel tremendously secure uh, when we're moving towards these places. It's very vulnerable. Uh, the changes that are, are made, we can sense on a level that it's what we need to do, what we want to do. We can sense that it's that way to create the balance in our lives that we need, but because it's the unknown, uh, it really requires that sense of trusting the process um, that sometimes it's almost like saying abstaining. Like, okay, so I know this isn't good for me. I might not know yet what's replacing it, but it's that famous, the power of the no, or the no power. <laughs> That's sometimes what Pluto can really help us with. <laughs> That's my, my joke to myself. Um, so when we're moving towards the polarity points, then it's a way to balance out the places that we're revisiting or the places that have become habitual and that are no longer serving our growth in the current lifetime. So let's say, for example, Pluto's polarity point being in the first house, uh, the soul is going to naturally be moving into a space where uh, they're initiating their own actions. They're not asking uh, another person if it's okay before they do it. They're simply going to do. That's really the motto of the first house. I'm just going to. <laughs> and uh, it's really balancing out that labor tendency to always ask another person if it's okay, to be hesitant because of worried about uh, what the other person might say, what they might think, or that it might upset the balance of the relationship. Sometimes that Pluto in the seventh house knows intrinsically that other people are looking to them to have their needs met and that by moving into that first house, that that might shift the relationship a bit in terms of, uh, in terms of what the soul uh, is feeling comfortable providing for another person within relationships and what they're not. Uh, by initiating their own actions, by initiating their own autonomy, uh, because sometimes they can attract others that have essentially become very secure with the codependent relationship as it is. And by that soul breaking that pattern, by that soul moving into its own life path, its own direction, independent from that relationship, the whole apple cart gets upset. And with the seventh house, that can be very uncomfortable but it's where uh, the evolutionary currents are moving, regardless of whether the soul is cooperating or not. Um, that's the current evolutionary path, um, is to break out of relationships like that, to, again, to develop one's own voice and to, uh, for lack of a better word, to just do, uh, to just initiate what feels right without waiting for the percent, uh, consent or permission of another to do so. Um, and let's say, uh, so if the south node was in the ninth house, then the north node is going to be in the third house. So how is that first house polarity point going to be consciously integrated? Uh, the north node symbolizes the evolution, the forming or developing egocentric structure or self-image of that soul. It's the, uh, the egocentric stroll it's the egocentric structure that the soul is creating for itself in order to actualize its current evolutionary intentions. Uh, so in this case, in the third house, it's going to be uh, communication, it's going to be uh, expression of ideas, uh, it can be articulation, uh, it can be uh, being able to communicate uh, in a new way to others. First, uh, Pluto's polarity point in the first, uh, uh, North Node being in the third, there's going to be a lot of dynamic instinctual speaking. Uh, when the soul loses the te tendency to, uh, to filter itself or when the soul uh, is, uh, can uh, work through that barrier in terms of, oh my gosh, you know, what response am I going to get from others or how are others going to react to this or 
uh, how is this going to impact my partner? Uh, that first first third house can be very, oh, oh it just came out. <laughs> I just said it. I just did it. This is just what feels right. Uh, so there can be new ways of expression. There can be new ways of communication uh, um, that really help that soul balance uh, the tendency to create codependencies, to uh, either play the student-teacher dynamic. For example, the soul could communicate uh, the inherent principle of equality that would be the bottom line of that Pluto in the seventh house. Look, I'm not the student, I'm not the teacher. You're not the teacher, I'm not the student. We're both, we're simultaneous student teachers to one another. That could be that new cycle, uh, simply put, is that so we'll be initiating a brand new evolutionary cycle in which uh, equality is the bottom line where there's not that uh, back and forth, where there's not those imbalances, where there's not that extremity, uh, but both people uh, inherently uh, being able to, to learn and also to, uh, uh, to teach others, so to speak. Um, and then they, that sense of adopting uh, other people's truths or other people's adopting their truths uh, could be purged. Uh, so again, going back to see how I referred it back uh, to the natal positions, to the, uh, the Pluto's natal position in the south node and its planetary ruler. Um, uh, there's a circuit of energy here, and I really want to impress that point. There's a circuit of energy here uh, that the soul can rebalance or readjust relative to moving into uh, the opposite archetypes or the opposite signs. Uh, so the new cycle relative to communication, no longer student-teacher or vice versa, uh, but both souls uh, teaching, learning from each other, uh, the soul being able to articulate, uh, this is my viewpoint and this isn't, um, here, uh, here's my way of communicating. Uh, so it would lose again, it would break free or it would purge that tendency to uh, adopt or to adjust to other people's truths or vice versa. Uh, is that making sense so far? Uh, are we on the same page? Yes, it's making great sense, Deva. I have a question, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I know we're talking about natal Pluto paradigm at the moment, but what about transiting Pluto and the transiting south and north nodes? Can we apply, how can we apply and understand the trinity of the past, and the trinity of the future in terms of transits? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking. Um, and uh, that's a, a great topic from my understanding to, to, uh, to explore more um, uh, for myself uh, and uh, the way that I've understood it uh, at this point in time um, is that Pluto transits and the transiting nodes will symbolize where the current change is happening or where you're going to be experiencing that shift from past to future in the current moment in time relative to that natal position of Pluto, relative to the main evolutionary karmic dynamic uh, within the birth chart. Uh, so for example, um, uh, you can look at uh, the south node as seeing where what dynamics from the past the soul is currently going to be experiencing. It can also create a sense of uh, the surface problem uh, versus the actual problem. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, when you when you look at these, uh, when you look at that uh, Pluto transit and when you look at um, the south node transiting south and north node, uh, from my understanding, you're really seeing uh, how that soul, uh, the current themes that are going to be facilitating uh, change uh, for that soul in the current nature and time. And then again, when you look at the transits, you put that in context with the natal chart. Uh, so the, uh, the archetypes that are emphasized through transit are going to symbolize where that soul is experiencing change at that moment in time relative to past south node and future north node and Pluto, uh, what archetypes are being emphasized via that Pluto transit. Great, thank you. David, there's a question in the uh, chat. Um, they want to know what if they are all in the same sign, the south node, 
south node ruler pluto sign so i'm assuming that she's of the uh scorpio south node generation and also pluto and scorpio conjunct yeah um i mean i can't i could only give generals because you can't isolate symbols um and right, determine right. their meaning from an evolutionary point of view um but what you can uh, generally determine if you have all three um is that the archetypes of uh, abandonment betrayal and loss uh, the archetype of um regeneration or the archetype of evolution itself wanting to penetrate current limitations you could see psychological knowledge being carried in um so there would be a lot of a lot of energy around metamorphosis around understanding the ways of things and the potential for carrying in wounds relative to misapplication of trust um and uh, uh looking at the polarity points then generally speaking uh, the soul would be wanting to regain a sense of self-sufficiency. What do I have within myself? Um, how can I uh, make this, how can I break free from limited patterns by using resources that are intrinsic to me that I already have? Uh, um, so, I mean, those are very generals. I mean, that was an eight second house description. Um, so you'd have to look at the total chart to really understand uh, the signature. Right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Um, Deva, I'd like to sort of summarize my understanding of that circuit of energy to see if I'm on the right track here, because I love that expression, circuit of energy. Um, so in terms of not rejecting or abandoning, you know, your Pluto placement or your south node, would it be safe to say that the North Node, the Pluto Planet Point, you know, the Trinity of the future are basically about, or the, the is to, to sort of support and up level that experience of security in the Pluto area of life to more include and integrate the qualities of the North Node and the Pluto Planet Point. Is, is that a fair way of saying it? Yes, that, 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 that's exactly right. That that's how that. Uh, archetype or how the NATO Pluto can be reversed by by going to its opposite by including uh, its opposite as you were saying yeah so it's really not it's not so much the it's making it's it's making the polarity work better sort of right to in, integrate more of the opposite to make make it more inclusive and more expansive and not just be have your security be compulsively a money area that that's that's exactly right yes Okay, great, great, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, so yeah, um, let's to uh, I'll finish this out uh, before we move to the examples. Uh, the planetary ruler then of the Norse node, uh, well, we'd have to, we'd have to put a sign, wouldn't we? Um, gosh, third house. Uh, well, let's just go ahead. Let's let's say let's uh, say that I put the South Node uh, in Sag and the North Node in Gemini. It's because um, we got to use the rulers there, uh, and then let's let's pick a, a house. So let's put that. Uh, let's put the planetary ruler would then be Mercury if the uh, North Node is in Gemini, and let's put uh, Mercury in the eighth house. So how would that soul go about consciously integrating the North Node? How would the North Node be consciously actualized or developed? It would be through that eighth house archetype. Uh, it would essentially be the soul uh, asking uh, the questions why, uh, boiling things down to the bottom line uh, in terms of uh, what, what, what information uh, do I find to be true and what not. Uh, that would be Pluto's polarity point in the first, uh, nor uh, North Node being in Gemini. And it could also be that uh, correlating to that instinctual communication. It, the bottom line would then be one of equality or would be communicating from the standpoint of uh, no student teacher, no uh, teacher student, uh, 
uh, none of this, you know, uh, save you're saved if that's what was happening in the relationship. Uh, but it would really be communicating relative to that uh, Pluto in the first house, the new cycle that was happening. Um, that things are on a, a co-equal level. Um, uh, again, we can all learn, be taught from each other. That would be one way that could play out, but it could be a very direct type of communication that way. Uh, that the soul, again, would be purging itself of any information that was artificial, that no longer served, uh, um, that the soul couldn't relate to or found, frankly, to be BS. Uh, that's all that eighth house archetype. And then communicating from a very direct, succinct, and bottom line point of view uh, so that uh, the limitations of the past could be uh, transformed and that that new cycle would be uh, communicated within the relationship. Uh, the path, uh, the path that the soul is now taking, so to speak. Um, and that soul could also, uh, that's also the soul confronting its own intellectual limitations. Um, it would be uh, actively scrutinizing uh, information that it had taken in that it now sees as uh, limited. Uh, that's also Mercury in the eighth is very uh, uh, wanting to evolve past uh, limited intellectual information relative to the North Node in Gemini, uh, embracing uh, diversity, unity and diversity, uh, wanting to explore uh, other points of view other than the beliefs that it become secure with, South Node and Sag, uh, the ruler of that being in the fourth house. Uh, so another way this could be expressed, again, one no, no one size fits all, uh, how this could be manifesting in real life is that the soul could be asserting its own right uh, to communicate its own point of views, to have the freedom to explore. Uh, Gemini is very much curiosity. Uh, so it could have attracted a partner who was attempting to restrict uh, the ability to explore other beliefs, to explore other points of view, and the soul could be breaking that. The soul could say, no, I'm sorry, I've got Mercury in the eighth house, and no, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do Pluto in the first, Pluto's polarity point in the first. I'm now just going to do. Um, so I'm just trying to make this concrete, how this would be manifesting in real life. Again, you'd have to put in the whole context, uh, but the point was really to boil down the heart of those archetypes um, relative to the Pluto's paradigm. Um, so are we on the same page? Is, is that making sense so far? Yes. Okay, so I'm thinking then if there aren't any questions that we can go ahead and again, the best way to teach the Pluto paradigm is through real examples because we can then put all the individual context um, in order to uh, really get into the, the heart of the Pluto paradigm and, and how to uh, read a chart from an EA point of view. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and we'll look at the chart and we'll look at the example charts and I'll give the background. Uh, so the first example um, is Hillary Clinton. And she is uh, in the third stage consensus. Um, she grew up uh, with Methodist uh, religious conditioning. Um, and she was in the uh, middle, uh, mi middle uh, social strata uh, when she was growing up. Um, in her uh, natal chart, she has Pluto in the ninth house. Um, she has South Node being in Scorpio in the first house, uh, which is conjunct Jupiter uh, in the first house. South Node is also conjuncting uh, Mercury, uh, which conjuncts Venus, uh, and also Chiron. Um, so looking at this chart, uh, being in the third stage consensus, uh, she is somebody who's able to uh, determine or somebody who is able to understand how the system works, how it's structured, uh, and or it, it understands its, its bottom line or, or to understand its inherent philosophical truth um, that's underneath the structure of things, seeing that Saturn's in the first house. Uh, and Mars is in a, a culminating phase, or it's in a closing phase. Um, so looking at this, she had gained all the knowledge of how uh, society works uh, in order uh, to uh, potentially advance. Uh, she uh, gravitated to consensus views uh, in order to understand uh, 
what her truth was, um, but underlying it all is the uh, ninth house uh, desire for honesty in order to purge all uh, inner uh, lies, in order to expose all of its inner exaggerations and lies and so on. Uh, the desire to understand its own personal truth and to become absolutely honest with oneself and with others. Um, uh, she also taught law uh, earlier in her life, which is an expression of Pluto and Leo in the ninth, how she creatively actualized herself. Um, and looking at all this Scorpio energy, uh, South Node being in Scorpio in the first, uh, relative to third stage consensus and Mercury Venus, um, she did attract, uh, or she, wa uh, she was in a, uh, going through a dynamic where uh, feeling a sense of disempowerment uh, relative to gender. You can see that with Pluto-Saturn. Um, so uh, creating alliances or creating relationships with those who seemed to embody the power um, that she herself uh, was wanting um, through marriages and so on. Um, I, where her trust was uh, ultimately abandoned in ways. I mean, she was attracting those who uh, essentially wanted uh, to project uh, that she was uh, manipulating situations, um, that she was concealing things uh, underhanded. Uh, look at the Benghazi trial. <laughs> I, mean, I think it was over 11 hours of absolutely being grilled and the way that she handled it. I mean, I remember she said, you want to keep asking me the same question for 11 hours, I'll find a million different ways to answer your same question. <laughs> so she was able to, to approach it with humor, uh, but we can see the struggle here of uh, um, uh, wanting to uh, purge those limitations of, of feeling disempowered and also of uh, uh, disillusionment, seeing uh, Pluto being in Pisces in the, or Moon being in Pisces in the fourth of uh, feeling disillusioned relative to uh, the type of uh, uh, situations where, again, uh, rendered powerless in certain ways, uh, always uh, being projected as being corrupt. Um, and uh, uh, that North Node in the seventh, it was really throwing her back on herself um, so that she could come deeper into her emotional truths. Uh, I mean, she is really a strong voice for uh, equality, North Node in the seventh, for uh, creating an equal playing field. Um, uh, she's a big advocate of uh, education and also children's rights. Uh, seeing that moon in the fourth, uh, speaking for those who had experienced uh, feeling disempowered and uh, a similar disillusionment. And one of the things she said that I really found, you can see that transition uh, to the evolutionary future was that the more she became involved in politics, it became less and less of a personal uh, emotion and it became more of a universal emotion. Uh, so for example, she wasn't fighting for uh, mothers or women's causes because she was herself a woman or a mother, uh, but it became something uh, with Moon and Pisces that was uh, humanitarian, that was something uh, higher than just a personal cause. Uh, and seeing uh, Pluto, uh, um, uh, making a culminating phase to Mars, um, there can also be a release there of personal ambition or of personal desire, so to speak, that uh, not uh, fighting, uh, not being defined by position. She fought tooth and nail for her position <laughs> um, and uh, becoming something uh, where she was more connected to something universal or timeless. Uh, seeing that, that Pluto being in Pisces, uh, or that Moon being in Pisces, and also seeing the North Node in Taurus, that she broke from those limited relationships, or she broke from uh, those types of power struggles by uh, shifting into uh, making it happen on her own. Uh, uh, her message was powerful enough, in my view, to stand on its own uh, without any influence from others. Um, uh, that's the way I would read that, and that transition from past to future. Uh, and relative to this third stage individuated, um, there must be something more than this uh, in terms of uh, political position or outdated uh, ambition that could perhaps become uh, woof, really big with the Scorpio energy and the Mars and Leo uh, culminating uh, and it becoming uh, something uh, that was more, again, uh, universal or uh, humanitarian, the emotional shifts that was happening.
Um, and she's uh, right now she's advocating for younger people who want to create change. Um, so she's not running, but she's uh, supporting grassroots. That's how she's reintegrating. She's supporting grassroots uh, communities, uh, grassroots political movements, uh, investing in them. Uh, um, those kind of things. Looking at the North Node being in Taurus in the seventh and Pluto's polarity point in the third in Aquarius, grassroots, communicating their ideas. Uh, um, uh, so the uh, very uh, um, dynamic chart in terms of uh, an emotional shift that uh, is coming through uh, uh, um, the support of uh, uh, the community uh, as it's happening uh, with the youth and uh, with more of the grassroots versus within the system. Um, and becoming more independent from the system. Uh, North polarity point being in Aquarius in the third house. Um, uh, any questions or uh, uh, any additional thoughts about her chart? And to follow that through too, look at the planetary ruler, that north node uh, being also in Scorpio, uh, conjunct Mercury on the south node in terms of revisiting or in order to bring, uh, to bring something to a resolution in the 12th house um, and how that played out or how that's now balancing itself out. Okay. Uh, so if we're all on the same page, we can go ahead and move to the other exa uh, another example. And uh, he's in the third stage individuated, uh, Charles Darwin. Um, he grew up uh, in the uh, lower to middle uh, economic class. And he uh, was more, uh, he went to a, a Christian school. Um, but he himself didn't feel uh, attached uh, to uh, their beliefs or uh, to the uh, evangelical Christian uh, education system. Um, and looking at his chart, he's got Pluto and Pisces in the third house, uh, and he's got the south node being in Taurus in the fifth, uh, and the planetary ruler of that is Venus in Aries, uh, also in the third house. Uh, so in terms of uh, coming into the life, um, uh, being able to uh, tune into ideas that were universal, uh, Pluto and Pisces in the third, uh, also a sense of disillusionment with uh, what was currently being expressed, um, uh, knowing that inherently uh, there were things being taught that couldn't be true <coughs> or it couldn't be so. Um, looking at the Saturn, uh, in Pi looking at Saturn and Sag in the twelfth and the Neptune there, um, uh, making a square to that Pluto uh, and also to Mercury. Um, so knowing uh, or not feeling connected to uh, what was being taught, uh, especially in uh, universe uh, from a religious uh, point of view, um, seeing the Sag uh, Pisces element. Um, and seeing uh, North Node being in Taurus in the fifth house, having a sense of uh, a special purpose relative to uh, the principles or w what he was able to bring forward uh, was very much linked with uh, the survival of the species, uh, survival of the fittest, um, that, uh, and also uh, a sen uh, being able to uh, convey uh, the nuts and bolts or uh, being able to convey uh, through sharing ideas, um, uh, an essential principle, uh, but in a new way, uh, seeing Venus uh, being an Aries in the third house, being able to bring uh, new ideas forward, um, inherently being tuned into creation, uh, Pluto and Pisces in the third relative to uh, the survival, uh, survival of the fittest, uh, seeing that that's that seeing that creation was inherently in a state of uh, mutation, North Node being in Aries, or sorry, North Node being in Scorpio, uh, conjunct Uranus. Um, <clears throat> and you could see the challenge there that he had relative to uh, bringing out ideas that were uh, transformational or that didn't uh, support the norm. Uh, 
he's got moon in Capricorn in the 12th house and it uh, or in the second house and it squares the Mars and uh, Libra in the 10th um, so there's that conflict between what was traditionally accepted by authorities uh, um, <clears throat> and not wanting to upset the apple cart but in the end having to do so uh, because of his findings uh, no e even though knowing uh, they were controversial uh, bringing them out there and uh, accepting uh, what may come, so to speak. Um, but seeing how there was this whole transformation in regards to uh, purging uh, the delusional ideas that uh, were traditionally taught uh, that may have created a sense of survival for him to gravitate to and progressively finding security with his direct observations. Uh, North Node being in Scorpio, uh, Uranus being in Scorpio in the 11th, uh, and the polarity point, Pluto being in the ninth, um, Virgo, uh, discerning natural law, uh, the way that creation actually worked uh, relative to uh, the origin of species, that uh, different species uh, evolved relative to uh, the survival needs uh, and also to survival of the fittest, um, <clears throat> that it, uh, creation wasn't fixed or static, uh, that it was an uh, inherent process of motion, uh, of rebirth, death, rebirth, and so on, uh, relative to this underlying principle of survival. Moon in the second, south node in Taurus, uh, and so on. Um, and seeing his own growth through bringing out these ideas, uh, becoming inherently uh, somebody who was embraced as a, uh, a teacher of these things, or somebody who was able to impart knowledge that uh, helped uh, the consensus or the mainstream evolve, and that's the hallmark of the third stage individuated, is to integrate a unique capacity in order to help the mainstream itself evolve, uh, which essentially, uh, even though it was rejected and, and seen as uh, blasphemous and heretical, ultimately it did have the impact of moving the consensus forward. Uh, looking at uh, Uranus in the 11th, North Node uh, in the 11th with uh, being in the sign of Scorpio. Um, and uh, how he, uh, looking that it's trining uh, his Pluto uh, and also his Mercury, uh, Uranus making a direct trine to his Mercury, he was able to communicate. He was able to bring these, eyes, bring these ideas out there nonetheless. Um, so does that make sense? Are we on the same page? Any additional thoughts about his chart? Um, yeah, Deva, I'm just wondering, does the ruler of the Pluto polarity point facilitate the the uh, evolutionary intentions? Oh, so looking at the ruler of the of the house? No, of the ruler of the Pluto polarity point, which would be Mercury in this case. Oh, I see. Um, that's a great question and uh, something I haven't uh, really looked into. Um, okay, but it would be okay to use it though, wouldn't it? As far as I understand, yes. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Deva, I was wonder wondering, um, how do you handle, or, or I guess, um, let's see, the conjunction, when there's a conjunction to Pluto? How is that factored in? Yeah, great question. And when you see a conjunction to Pluto, uh, essentially that planet is acting in tandem or it's like it's fused with Pluto. So it's operating at the same time. Um, uh, so you're looking at those two planetary archetypes essentially working as one. And then uh, of course you'd have to determine whether it's in a new phase uh, in a new cycle or whether it's in a culminating phase or in a closing cycle. Um, but let's say, for example, if Pluto is conjunct Mercury, Pluto and Mercury are operating together uh, as a, a fused unit operating at the same time. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. So I was looking at this, all that conjunction there in um, Charles Darwin's chart. So. Yeah, it's all of that's firing at the same time. Um, and look, Pluto's uh, Mercury in this case is in a closing phase. So in terms of culmination uh, of past thoughts, of uh, ways that he's communicated in the past, uh, he did become a messenger 
uh, and he became a messenger through a clearing or through a closing of uh, um, uh, times when perhaps uh, he didn't deliver the message, uh, but it was really closing or maybe times where he wasn't heard. Uh, um, but there's a, a closing of an evolutionary cycle through communication of uh, new ideas, um, uh, trans transformation and so on. Uh, so again, that's firing at the same time. Okay, so if we're all on the same page, uh, we can move to the next chart. Uh, and this is uh, an example of somebody in the spiritual state. Uh, Jane Goodall's in the first stage spiritual. Um, she's got Pluto in the eighth house in Cancer, uh, South Node being in Leo in the eighth, and North Node being in Aquarius uh, in the second house. Um, uh, so she also came in uh, with issues of power, powerlessness, uh, relative to gender, um, a sense of special purpose or special destiny uh, that perhaps uh, was wanting to be rebirthed relative to uh, psychological knowledge uh, through bringing out a creative talent to its maximum. That's what Leo in the Eighth would really want. Um, <clears throat> and that coming through uh, this, or the, uh, the ruler of that being the sun in Aries in the fourth conjunct Mars, definitely somebody who was striking her own path in this life, uh, who broke new ground, uh, who was able to uh, uh, um, initiate change or who was able to bring about change uh, uh, through initiation. Uh, that's that Aries archetype. And uh, um, her mother was a big part of that. Her mother always validated that uh, no matter how silly your dream is, uh, go for it. No matter how many times people laugh at you, uh, call you unlearned, or say it'll never happen, put it into motion. Uh, look at that Aries in the fourth conjunct Mars, Pluto being in Cancer, South Node in Leo, uh, an affirming mother who was able to help uh, her overcome those situations. I mean, uh, to me, she's very inspirational because she was somebody who had no formal education, uh, who simply had a love of animals. That was her only qualification. <laughs> Other than that, <laughs> um, and yet her perseverance. Um, uh, she saved, uh, she worked as a, a secretary, happened to come into contact with, I think his name is Leaky who was uh, putting, uh, who was uh, wanting to do field study in Africa, took note of Jane's love of, of animals uh, um, uh, through their interactions. And uh, it was exactly because of how un, uh, formally trained she was that she was picked for the assignment. Because they were really just wanting objective documentation. And look at her north node, Aquarius in the second house conjunct Saturn. Objective documentation. <laughs> and that's what she did. Um, she and she, what her findings were were uh, things that people had a hard time again uh, accepting because of their traditional understanding of animals, what they were capable and not capable of doing. For example, she found that chimpanzees use tools. What did that do to the belief system uh, relative to human and animal relationship? Well, humans are the only ones that are smart enough to use tools, right? Wrong. <laughs> Objective documentation. <clears throat> and that's all that she did. Uh, and it was uh, regenerating for her. It's almost like what she reported was uh, the simplicity of her life in Africa was its own kind of homecoming. Uh, um, Pluto, that she felt more of a, an emotional connection within nature and within animals. Uh, uh, look at the moon being in uh, Sag in the 12th house, um, Pluto being in Cancer in the 8th, uh, so it being uh, integrated through uh, um, uh, speaking for those who, who didn't have a voice. Um, uh, one of her most beautiful quotes is, uh, uh, where one does not have a voice, there I shall go singing, uh, in terms of uh, uh, speaking for those, again, who can't speak for themselves and uh, her focus around conservation and education. Um, 
that uh, through presenting this information in an alternative way, she was able to help promote uh, wildlife conservation, uh, more of an empathy uh, for animals in terms of speaking out against cruelty that was happening. Uh, I think she was one of the biggest spokespeople against testing, uh, not just for chimpanzees, but she really spoke to the emotional life of animals as not being that too far different from our own. Uh, so the dynamic of empathy, of changing our views of how we relate to nature and to wildlife, uh, breaking new ground uh, um, uh, through just obje objectively documenting what was, what was out there in nature, uh, independent from traditional theories, uh, beliefs, uh, what was uh, accepted at the time, and so on. Um, uh, and uh, it really speaks to uh, from my vantage point, the emotional lives of animals, seeing Pluto being in cancer, that uh, um, she was able to portray that in her own way. Uh, she was able to speak to the grief uh, that mothers feel at the death of their babies. Uh, she, gives, or, uh, she gives many examples of uh, how animals have emotional lives. Of course, you have to be very careful because of uh, they, how they wanted to report these things. Um, uh, but her groundbreaking work at showing what they were capable of, how they live, uh, really dispelled a, a lot of misunderstandings around, uh, chim around uh, nature in general uh, and helped uh, facilitate the desire to conserve, uh, to educate, uh, um, uh, and to protect nature. Um, and again, how she started out as being a virtually unknown, uh, untrained uh, person uh, and how through perseverance uh, she broke new ground uh, and it came through both Darwin and herself uh, it came through observation and correlation uh, which is one of the re one of the reasons I picked these charts it's very connected to evolutionary astrology it's natural science um, uh, which is uh, to me the strength of the work and it creates uh, a foundation uh, for bringing things uh, into the future or uh, um, uh, can correlate to uh, the Aquarian energy of transformation. Um, and she herself went through a creative rebirthing again, going to Africa was its own kind of homecoming uh, relative to simplicity uh, and being in her element, being able to reconnect to nature, which was a big part of her past, seeing the, the moon being in Sag in the 12th and uh, um, uh, looking at the uh, the other components of her chart too, uh, um, in terms of Africa itself, uh, fourth house, uh, also uh, Saturn on the North Node. Uh, it wouldn't be surprising if that was some place where she had been very integrated within nature, um, but connected to the Daemon archetype for sure, seeing the, the moon being in the 12th uh, and conveying a, a message of uh, speaking for those who can't speak for themselves. Uh, so any other uh, thoughts about her chart? Uh, um. Um, yes, Deva. Um, I'm looking at the midheaven in Libra and mm -hmm. the, the ruler of that is Venus in Aquarius in the third house. So, uh, yeah, she really did transform things out there. And I'm interested in that Saturn conjuncting her north node and her venus and that would give her some authority would that be correct yeah that's right thank you uh so uh, um any questions about the pluto paradigm in terms of uh, grasping those core archetypes and then individual context again evolutionary state gender, uh, social economic state, those all need to be included. Uh, one size does not fit all, but when you understand the core, what we did at the beginning, when you understand the core archetypes and how those are essentially building blocks, how those are that foundation of the birth chart, how every other planet will be interpreted relative to that foundation, uh, the main evolutionary karmic dynamic of the chart, that when you get that, when you start with that, how you can then incorporate those mitigating factors. 
All right. Well, thanks so much for coming uh, and participating. Um, uh, I really appreciate the questions that you asked. And uh, if there aren't any closing thoughts or any questions, um, 